أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين verse 254 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أنفقوا مما رزقناكم من قبل أن يأتي يوم لا بيء فيه ولا حلة ولا شفاء والكافرون هم الظالمون O you who have faith spend out of what we have provided you before there comes a day on which there will be no bargaining neither friendship nor intercession and the faithless they are the wrongdoers This verse is again in the context of the previous verses when the ayat of jihad was read the example of Uh, what happened to previous nations when they were called to jihad and they did not respond positively, the story of Talut and Jalut. And then Allah mentioned about Telka Rusul, these are the messengers that we have mentioned, and after them always there were fightings, muqatala, battles. Now here, <coughs> it, the verse again encourages the mu'minun to spend on the way of defense. Of course, it's very general. It can be, in, in, it can be interpreted for defense or can be interpreted in any matter of charity and infaq. However, in the context, because it's about defending and uh, battles and such things, it means that the mu'minun should help with their money in the matter of defense. Now, going to the details of the verse, يا أيها الذين آمنوا أنفقوا مما رزقناكم من قبل أن يأتي يوم before a day comes. Now, which day is this? Some say it's the day of judgment and some say it's the day of moat, the day when a person dies. And both are correct. And it can be actually taken uh, as both instances. One on the date, on the time of death, of course, there is no No bay'un, there is no transaction anymore. It's all finished. La khullatun, there is no friendship anymore in the in, in sense that no friend can help a person, a dying person. And la shafa'a, there is no shafa'a on the day of death because shafa'a is for the hereafter. Because shafa'a is mentioned here, uh, some commentators say that it's more probably that this is, because, this is uh, referring to day when a person dies. On that day, there is no shafa'a, of course. Shafa'a is reserved for the very last stages of the Day of Judgment. Even in the initial stages of the Day of Judgment, there is no shafa'a. Shafa'a is the last lifeline that Allah gives to people. However, uh, it may mean that, he, because Allah mentions in other places that on the Day of Judgment as well, there will be no shafa'a. No, that means no unauthorized shafa'a. There is shafa'a, but unauthorized shafa'a will not be there, as the kuffar were thinking about unauthorized shafa'a, thinking that their idols would do shafa'a for them, would intercede for them. So, la shafa'a, if we take it for the day of judgment, you say la shafa'a, le ghayr al mu'minin. There is no shafa'a for non believers, because shafa'a is only what comes through the anbiya, the awliya, and these are. interceding for their followers. لا يشفعون إلا لمن ارتضى No, they would not do shafa'a unless for anyone who Allah is pleased with them. So shafa'a is there. Or for example, in other verses is uh, we have that يوم إذن لا تنفع الشفاعة إلا من أذن له الرحمن وقال ورضي له قولا On that day, there will be no shafa except for those that Allah issues permission that shafa should include them. And therefore, shafa is not something that the shafi, whether it's a prophet, an imam, or even people below them who are good believers, could do on their own accord. It's the a list. so to speak, if you want to say like this. A list is issued for them. 
metaphorically, a list is issued for them that these people should be included in your shafa'ah. It's not something that they want to do or they can, they have authority to do. The authority, authorization come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, la bay'un fi, of course, it means that you cannot have any transaction there to earn some money to do infaq on that day. La wattaqu yawman. Uh, you have this opportunity to have bay and transaction in this world and do charity from that, but on that day you cannot have, you cannot earn anything to do charity. is friendship. There is friendship, but there is no friendship for kuffar. As the Quran says, the friends on that day would turn into enemies, except muttaqun. Of course, for muttaqin, the friendships would not end. The friendship continues there. And most of the things which are said about day of judgment, in which there is no friendship, people run away from each other, is all about the evil people. The good people have all these opportunities to, to come together, to, to even help each other. Uh, so, uh, when, for example, when we have the verse, uh, every person has an affair with, in which he is completely occupied with, it may o also refer only to kuffar, not to the believers. Believers are dignified, they are honored, they are given certainly what they wish, and therefore they are excluded from all these threatening verses which are mentioned in the Quran. So, لا بيء فيها ولا خلة ولا شفاعة والكافرون هم الظالمون This is a sort of uh, restricting uh, uh, sentence that restricts zulm to kufr. And that means that the first, the foremost instance of zulm is kufr. And that zulm, of course, is wronging one's own self. If you want me to show you who is the real wrongdoer to themselves is kafirun. And like, for example, we say, Hawal faqihu fil Madina. He is the, the, the faqih in the city. It doesn't mean that there are not other fuqaha there. It means that if you want to ask me who is the foremost and best faqih, I, I say these are the fuqaha. So zalimun are many of course, on the Day of Judgment and in this world. But if you want to tell me who's the foremost of the Zalimun, who wronged themselves, they are kafirun. This is what this sentence, of course, signifies. Well, kafirun humu zalimun. Zalimun are, re real zalimun are the kafirun. Because kof is the greatest zalim and wrongdoing that one can do to themselves. Then, of course, a sweeping sort of a statement comes uh, as a conclusion or as a summary of all the verses that went before that, and that is, do not think that Allah is unaware of what's happening on the earth, do not think that Allah is ignorant, and do not think that things go without Allah's permission. Whatever we said, whatever you heard is under the care, under the uh, supervision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, of course, the very famous verse, Ayatul Kursi. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. La ta'akhuduhu sanatun wa la naum. Allah, there is no God except Him, is the living one, is the living one, is huwa al hay The only living one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because all other life, or other living beings, angels, human beings, their life depends on his life, depends on him. They can vanish, they can perish. In paradise, in this world, in, until eternity, they are not the living ones. They are the ones who are dependent on the living being. So life is for him. Everything not dependent on him, not directed to him, is, of course, perishing. It, it, it goes away. So, Hawal Hay and Hawal Qayyum, the same thing. He is the only one who uh, 
sustains. There's no other sustainer but him. Anyone else who sustains, whether they are angels, human beings, nature, they are all sustaining as they are sustained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the same thing. Now, here about Ayatul Kursi, uh, I think we have to elaborate a little bit on that because this is, as it's mentioned by the Prophet, it is Dharwatul Qur'an. For everything there is a peak, and the peak of the Qur'an is Ayatul Kursi. One of the most spectacular uh, statements given in any scripture. And as we have in other narrations, Allah never has given a statement about himself, a description of himself in any previous book, like this one which is given in Ayatul Kursi in uh, Surah Baqarah. And that's why Surah Baqarah is one of the most spectacular surahs of the Quran because this Ayatul Kursi is placed in there. There is a, just a few narrations about the merit of Ayatul Kursi and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam annaha a'azamu ayatan fi kitabullah. It's the greatest ayah in the book of Allah. It's the most comprehensive description of Allah in his Sifat al-Zat and Sifat al I will explain that uh, later, inshallah. وَأَنَّهَا مُشْتَمِلَةٌ عَلَىٰ إِسْمِ اللَّهِ الْأَعْظَمُ The Ism al-A'zam, the greatest name of Allah, is somehow hidden in this verse. And that's why uh, we are told that it is good to recite this every day. Every night before sleeping, after every salat, it is recommended to recite Ayatul Kursi. Now, a few other hadiths here. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Abal Mundhir. Abal Mundhir is uh, the kunya of Ubay ibn Ka'b. Ubay ibn Ka'b is, of course, the greatest scholar and the great companion of the, of the Prophet, peace be on him. The Quran that we read today is actually the compilation of Ubay ibn Ka'b at the time of Uthman ibn Affan. We talk about the Quran compiled at the time of Uthman. People say this is the compilation of Caliph Uthman. It's not compilation of Caliph Uthman. It is a compilation which was done at the time of Caliph Uthman under supervision of Ubay ibn Ka'ab, who was one of the greatest scholars of the Quran, quite close to Imam Ali alayhi salam, and uh, a team of 12 people, 12 companions who were experts in recitation of the Quran gathered together under his supervision and uh, they actually corrected all those sort of uh, wrong copies of the Quran, created this, not created, produced this uh, copy, this very authentic copy of the Quran based on recitation of Ubay ibn Ka'ab, which is of course taken from Imam Ali alayhi salam. So Ubay ibn Kaab is a very great scholar. All of us are indebted to him, and he was the one who was uh, in charge of that compilation at the time of the third Caliph Uthman. Now here, the Prophet asks him, Ya Abal Mundar, ayyu ayatin fi kitab Allah a'zam? Ya Abal Mundar, ayyu ayatin fi kitab Allah a'zam? Which verse in the Book of God is greatest? Qultu Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. Now of course, this means she has knowledge of all verses of the Quran. He can compare between them. He can give weight to some more than the others. And he said that Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. Qala fadaraba fi sadri. The Prophet tapped on my chest. Thumma qala leuhanna'ak al-ilm. You have great ilm. May you enjoy, rejoice from this great knowledge that Allah has given you. Walladhi nafsu Muhammadan bayadih. I swear by the one who's the life of Muhammad in his hand. Inna lahadhi al-ayala lisanan wa shafatayin taqaddasal. Tuqaddasul malak in the saq al-arsh. For this verse, there are a tongue and two lips. It is glorifying the king under the 
Arsh. It means that this verse is actually the best description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ayatul Kursi. Uh, when Allah, when the Prophet asked, we may say, of course, all the revelation of Allah are, are great, all the revelation of Allah are very good. So why we ask which one is better, which one is greater? Uh, it is very clear because some verses talk about social issues, for example. Some verses talk about avoiding sins. And some verses talk about description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about description of hereafter, certainly the subject of the verse determines the weight of the verse. It's not that the, some revelations are less valuable or less important than others. It's the subject which is dealt by the verse, which determines the weight of the verse. And that's why uh, Al-Ghazali, for example, has written the book on Jawahir al-Quran, the gems of the Quran, explaining and uh, demonstrating the differences between different verses of the Quran. Some of them are like gems in an ocean. Others, of course, are not as spectacular as, as, as these because, of course, the subject matter with which they deal is different. Anyhow, uh, another hadith which is reported from Imam Ali alayhi salam I heard your prophet on the woods of this member. Whoever continues reciting Ayatul Kursi after every wajib salat, nothing would deter him from entering paradise except death. It means as soon as they die, they enter the paradise of Barzakh and then the paradise of Akhara, inshallah. So it's only death which is step, stopping them from entering that paradise. Someone who, anyone who recites Ayatul Kursi after every wajib salat. Then he says, وَلَا يُوَذَبُ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا صَدِّيقٌ أَوْ عَابِدٌ And I tell you, no one would do this. No one would continue reciting it after every salat except someone who is a Siddiq. Siddiqin are, of course, the rank of people who are just below Anbiya, like Imam Ali, like Fatima al Zahra. These are Siddiqin, Siddiqat. وَلَا يُوَاذِبُ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا صِدِّيقٌ أَوْ عَابِدٌ Abid means someone who is somehow uh, preoccupied by worship. The worship in their life is taking more importance and weight than other things that they, than they, that they do. This is Abed. Not someone who do, for example, who, who does the wajibat and some of the mustahabat. No. Abed is someone who, dhikrullah, worship, these things have become the most important aspect of their life. So no one would continuously do that. Illa siddiqun aw Abed. وَمَنْ قَرَأَهَا إِذَا أَخَذَ مَذْجَأَهُ Anyone who recites it when they go to bed آمَنَهُ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ وَجَارِهِ وَجَارِ جَارِهِ وَالْعَبِيَاتِ حَوْلَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make him safe and would make their neighbors safe and would make their neighbors of their neighbors safe. Anyhow, if these reports are Authentic, which of course there are so many reports that it gives us tawatur or lafdi, conceptual tawatur, that Ayatul Kursi plays a very important role in many aspects of life of the mu'minun. Qala Imam Ali alayhi salam said again, Qala sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqulu ya Ali inna fiha la khamsina kalima fi kulli kalimatin khamsuna baraka. There are 50 words in Ayatul Kursi, and in every word there are 50 barakah. Now, when we talk about Ayatul Kursi, it is only one ayah. The two ayahs that follow it are not part of Ayatul Kursi. The two ayahs, usually in many uh, ibadat, for example, in certain salat or certain du'as, they say, recite Ayatul Kursi until hum fiha khalidun, means and the two other verses 
which follows it. But Ayatul Kursi is one Kursi. It's not Ayatul Kursi. It's only one. Uh, Ayatul Kursi is one verse, and uh, uh, it is verse number 255 of Surah Baqarah. Now, the first thing is about this ayah is that it starts with the term Allah. Allahu. La ilaha illahu. It doesn't, it doesn't say La ilaha illallah. It says Allahu. La ilaha illahu. It means that it wants to give that very significant emphasis on Allah in the verse. And we have about five verses, five, six verses in the Quran, which starts like this, Allahu la ilaha illahu. And uh, there's a very interesting uh, explanation by Imam al-Raza salam in El al sharaya that someone says, why we start iqama, why we start azan with Allahu Akbar and end with la ilaha illallah. And he says, because Allah wants his name to be first and his name to be last. The first term in Adan and Iqama is Allah, and the last word, term is Allah as well. Allahu Akbar and La ilaha illallah. Allah comes at the first beginning and at the end. And here Allah, of course, is given as the Mubtada, as the predicate, Allahu la ilaha illahu. There is no other ilah. Ilah is someone that you turn to for worship, you turn to for du'a, you turn to for uh, supplication, for najwa, this is Allah. There is no one in this world who actually is worth of that. Only Allah is worth to do that. No other, no, no human being, no prophet, no imam, no objects, no angels, nothing. Allah la ilaha illa who, only who, only he is the ilah of human beings. This, this, uh, I, this surah is a very, very comfort, comf, comforting surah, actually, very much. Because when you say, you completely give yourself into his hands, isn't it? He is my Rabb, he is my Malik, he is my Allah. And it is it brings peace and sakina to the heart when we recite this. There is no Rabb but him, there is no Malik king which rules about human beings except him, and no one that we turn to in our worship, in our du'a, but him. Now, there are two attributes mentioned here about Allah. One is Al-Hay, the other is Al-Qayyum, which actually combines all attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hay is the uh, combination or the uh, add-up of all Asma'uzzat. Ismuzat is something that Allah have before creation. Ismul fi'l is the name that Allah has after creation. So when we look at Allah without creation, He is knowledgeable, He is high, He is powerful. These are Asma'uzzat. So an high living is a name which actually all others go under it. If there is no hayat, there's no power, there's no knowledge, there's no elm. So hay is the uh, combination of all sifatu zat of Allah. وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَحْوٌ وَلَعِبْ وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ لَحْيَا الْحَيَوَانِ You want life, you want hayat, you want knowledge, you want power. These are of course the uh, the, the, the necessities of life, you can find it in Akhirah. Here, it's just a warming up. You have no knowledge here. You have no power here. The power and knowledge comes in Akhirah. So, it is Hayat. However, Hayat in Akhirah as well is, as I mentioned, is dependent on his Hayat. He is the only living. All other life are dependent on him, can vanish, can disappear, can be destroyed, and he is muhi, he is mumit, 
he, he does whatever he, he wishes. This is the hayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, the first thing which is mentioned here is huwal hay. And also we understand here why this sort of restricting sentence that he is the only living, huwal hay. And in other words, we have huwal hay la ilaha illa He is the only living because all other life is dependent on his life. There is no life if he did not give life to anyone else. And then Qayyum, uh, uh, as I said, is the sefa which combines all sefatul fi'l. Qayyum means sustainer, someone who sustains. First of all, he should create, then he should sustain in terms of giving rizq, razzaq, rahim, wadud, khalaq, all these go under the name Qayyum. And that's why he's Qayyum as wal as or Qayyam as wal as or Qayyam as wal as all have the same meaning. Uh, so, so his Razik, his Mubde, his Mu'eet, his Mu'eet, his Mu'eet, his Mu'eet, his Ghafur, his Rahum, all these go under the term Qayyum, his Qaymumiyah, the one who is sustaining everything through these names so it all goes under qayyum therefore allah la ilaha illallah al hayyu al qayyum is the most comprehensive description of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why it's good that after every salat we remind ourselves of this description of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all what he has that hayat which entails all other sifat, and secondly, that qayyumiyya that he has towards his creation. Now, there's one verse uh, uh, in Surah Ali Imran, which is one of the most spectacular verses of the Quran as well. Shahidallahu annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikatu wa ulul ilm. Allah testifies that there is no ilah but him. Now, when we say Allah testifies, means that his existence testifies to that. His action testifies to that. His creation testifies to that. That there is no Allah but him. Wal malaika and angels also testify to that because they have a knowledge of Allah that we do not have yet. Of course, inshallah, our knowledge would go beyond the knowledge of angels, but yet we are very small infant sort of creatures until we grow and expand in our uh, in our creation at this moment we cannot testify this we only testify by faith la ilaha illallah but when the angels testify la ilaha illallah they testify it out of knowledge out of witnessing they witness this is the case there is no ilah and ulul ilm ulul ilm are those people who are given knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the prophets, imams, Khidr, for example, these are ulul ilm. وَيَرَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ The أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ can see things in this world that other people cannot see. And what they witness is that he is قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْتِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْعَزِيزُ Hakim. Again, this La ilaha illahu al Azizul Hakim is a reiteration of Shahid Allah Annahu La ilaha illahu, but it is now informing us after Allah testifies by His very existence, the angels testify, Ulul Ilm testify, then so you say La ilaha illahu. There is no ilah but who. Now, this Qa'iman Bil Qist, why I mentioned this verse? Because this Qa'im, Qayyum, Qayyam, they come from the same root. Allah is Qayyum. It is a sort of uh, uh, exaggerated, intensive, intensive term for Qa'im. أَفَمَنْ هُوَ قَائِمٌ أَلَا كُلَّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ Allah is the one who sustains every soul and whatever they earn. Now, this Qa'im and Bilqis is a very, very fascinating description that Allah is sustaining everything with qist what is that? Allah sustains everything with qist 
قائما بالقس and this is what the angels testify and all the elders testify as well we cannot but that's why we always ask questions why there's evil why people are not equal why allah behaves in such way we cannot testify to this best in the action of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the angels the ulul ilm they testify that he is qa'iman bil qist qa'im the one who sustains is standing over everything sustaining them bil qist what is qist qist and adl they are usually uh, taken to be synonyms that qist like adl it means justice qa'iman bil qist but there is a sort of slight difference a nuance of difference in meaning between adl and qist Adl is, of course, justice as a concept. Qest is when justice, Adl, is put into practice. When it is put into practice. For, as we have in Surah Hujurat, that's... Uh, uh, وَإِنْ تَعِفَتَانِ مِلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَعَسْلُهُ بَيْنَهُمَا وَإِنْ بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَغْوِيَةَ تَفِيَةَ إِلَى أَمْرِ اللَّهِ فَإِنْ فَاعَتْ فَأَسْلِهُ بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَقْسِطُ So, there's عدل and it's قسط أَسْلِهُ بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَقْسِطُ So, you have to, of course, make compromise between them with justice, but do justice with them. So here, قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْطِ means that Allah sustains everything based on justice. He gives everything what they, they deserve. There is no injustice there. That we think because people are unequal, for example, there is no just No. He gives everything what they can take. Uh, as we have in Surah Hud, وَيُؤْتُ كُلَّ ذِي فَضْلًا فَضْلَهُ Anyone who has any merits, Allah will fulfill it for them. So this قَيُّمِيَّ of Allah is قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْتِ He is sustaining everything with us, whatever, anything which uh, have, uh, which can have, Allah will give it to them. This is one of the most difficult aspects of Irfan as well. That's how these capacities are different and why these different capacities are created by Allah and how they are fulfilled. Their capacities are actually uh, uh, flourished in this life by the sustenance of Allah is one of the most difficult aspects in Irfan. So, Al-Qayyumiyya, Al-Qayyumatul Al-Mutlaqa is that sifa, that attribute that all Asma'ul Husna apart from Asma al-Zat, all Asma al-Husna go back to him. So this very sentence, Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum, is, we can say it's Asmullah al-A'zam, if one can get the depth of it, if one, it actually includes all other Asma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's why we should not, Inshallah, deprive ourselves from reciting this verse after every salat and at any time that we can. Now, the rest of the verse, of course, inshallah, we leave it for next week. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ala tahirin. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Do we have any questions? Thank you very much for your lecture. Sheikh, just, uh, sorry, I, I lost my concentration right at the very end when you said about this being one of the most um, interesting, stroke, difficult aspects of Irfan. Could you just elaborate on that? How, how does that? Yeah. Uh, you know why the capacities are different? The fact that everyone who has any capacity, Allah will give whatever they can take is easy. This is what Ibn Arabi calls Faisul Aqdas and Faisul Muqaddas. Faisul Aqdas is when Allah actually somehow uh, cuts the, uh, the, the, the construction of every creation or every being. Why am I, for example, given this capacity? 
why the horse is given that capacity, why the angel is given that capacity. Yes, of course, human beings, they have a purpose. If they follow, it's fulfilled by Allah. Allah gives them whatever they deserve. The angels, the same thing. The animals, the same thing. But in the first place, why these differences are there? Why Allah has cut them in these different shapes and different capacities is something which is very difficult for us to understand. It is, uh, it is the wisdom of Allah which makes these differences. And then, of course, we say these differences are there. Everyone following their course, they will receive that faizul muqaddas from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives the grace. But that initial grace that I am caught as a human being in creation, and someone else is caught as an angel in the creation. And someone else is caught as a male, as a female, as a, for example, uh, as an animal, as a plant. This is what is very difficult to understand from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Uh, we start with Ms. Ankle. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Um, do you mind, um, the has just started with a very interesting subject, but do you mind if I just go back to you, the ayah before that, um, that we discussed about Shafa, and I know we have talked about this subject many times before, but I just want to have some, some, need some clarification based on what you said today. So first of all, you said that the, the, the givers of Shafa, or if you like, the, uh, the people who actually are able to part uh, or activate Shafa, if you like, Rasul, Aima, and then uh, people below. So by that you mean the Siddiqin and... Mu'minun can also do Shafa for the family. Well. So, so uh, you, you mean they'll be able to do Shafa for the family on the yes. day as well, right? Right up to it comes to low, as lower a level as, as family members as yes, well. Is yes, it? yes. Okay. So my, my next question to that is that you said the recipients of that uh, are the Mu'mineen and Muslimun, uh, that I have difficulty. So, I mean, why can't um, a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu who believes, who is not a kafir? No, by Mu'minun, I mean all believers. Everybody. So, for the Jews, there's Musa and Harun, yeah. there yeah. who do Shafa, yes. huh? right. and other uh, yes. Jewish prophets. Yes. For Christians, there is Isa alayhi salam who does yes. Shafa. Huh? Okay. Why? So, so everybody is included in the whole yeah, world. What, except disbelievers. By disbelievers, I don't mean non-Muslims. Yeah. By disbelievers, I mean those who, who do not believe in any prophet. Atheists. Yeah. Atheists. Atheists or those who do not believe in any prophet. Right. They want to their own yeah. path, for yeah. example. I, I believe fundamentally everybody fit by in fitra should be believing in God. There must be some major problems in his mind or her mind not accepting God. But 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 let's leave that discussion for the moment. So, so my, the, the, the third question is that I think you said that the Shafa comes at the very end. It's not during Barzakh, it's just at the very end, yes? And then you also said that the authority has to approve the giving of the Shafa. So, so now here I have difficulty. So the, 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 the most powerful Shafa giver is a prophet, from my point of view, my prophet. Allah. Allah, all Allah is shafa'atu jamaa. Fine, okay, oh, yes, of course. All belongs to him. Sure, sure, okay. okay. So, so the next step. So, so what, is, what is the power of Prophet with respect, I ask, if he still has to ask Allah if he can give shafa? No one in this world has any power. No one. So, it's so. It all comes from, it's just hawal hai. The only living is him. No one has life except Allah. Subhanahu so why don't we just conclude by saying that the only person, only only day, only, only in, I don't want to say he or it, only in the, the, the only Allah. Only Allah. You want to say he or she? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, only Allah <laughs> can give shafa. Only Allah can give you know, shafa. Nobody else can. But let's take it, uh, take an example of this world. Only Allah can guide. Yes. But we are not guided except through the Prophet, isn't it? I agree. Allah sends prophets to guide us. I agree. But even when we accept that, yes. Allah should guide our hearts, isn't yes. it? So without the prophets, without the imams, you cannot be guided in this way. Agree. The same thing with Shafa. Shafa is in hands of Allah. Yeah. But without it comes through that. It's because it should come to human world when it 
is issued from Allah, it should come to human world in that life, okay? Yeah. And that comes through human beings. And these are the prophets, imams, and even as we have in hadith, for example, a good believer can, uh, can uh, do shafa'a for as many members of his okay. family as the tribe of Mudar and yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah, okay, so I understand. But so, so the common, common person's thinking of aima or Rasul being able to actually intervene and, and save them is false, no. isn't it? Uh, of course. I mean, is it, that statement is false, isn't take it? Take the example of, uh, for example, guidance in this world. Yes. I mean, just by confessing that I believe in the Prophet, yes. uh, we are not guided yes. unless we follow it, isn't yes. it? Yes. So, yeah, it's, there's also this wrong conception that yes. uh, just because I confess I'm going to be yeah. saved. No. Yeah. It's la yashfa'una illa liman irtada. Except with whom Allah is pleased. Yes. Yeah, that's where this shafa yeah. comes. L let's just agree also another bold statement I'm making that there's no point anybody relying on Prophet and Aima that they will be their saviors if they haven't satisfied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, satisfaction of, Al of the Prophet is satisf satisfaction of Allah. We say that we receive his shafa'a if we satisfy him, isn't it? Yes. His satisfaction is satisfaction yeah. of Allah. But again, uh, a, the, but the, the, the point is, we understand this better yeah. when we bring it in our human relations, saying yeah. that because I have done such and such and Prophet, yes. I have satisfied the Prophet with yeah. my actions, yeah. and I have a love for Prophet, peace yeah. be on him. Yes. Then, but none uh, of those comes at the expense of fundamental, absolute obedience and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely. Yeah? So, yeah, so no, matter, no matter how close you feel, close to Imam Hussein, how, no matter how no, this many ziyarah you're done. This is, this is a very, very uh, <laughs> important hadith from Imam Jafar al salam On his death uh, bed, he, uh, he actually instructed that all his family should come. And when all the family came, you know, big family, all the Shia, Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet, Sadat, who were Ahlul Bayt, children of A'imma Ali Musalam, they came and he said, I have gathered you to say one thing. La tanalu shafa'atuna man salat. Our shafa'a would not include those who take salat lightly. It's very clear, isn't it? So this is how shafa'a works. Son, thank you so much. Some Muslims are Zalim as well. So they, they change to Kafir as well? Or what? Kufr has different meanings, okay? Yeah. Once you reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's Kufr. Once you reject a prophet, it's Kufr. You believe in God but reject a prophet. For example, uh, uh, we have الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ So, أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ who rejected the Prophet, although they were on their faith, they believed in God, but they became kafir in this sense, not in rejecting God, rejecting the Prophet. And sometimes a person becomes a kafir by rejecting to thank Allah for his bounties. This is another type of kafir. And sometimes a person becomes kafir by rejecting a tenet of faith by not accepting it, like what Allah mentions about Hajj. So rejection of Hajj by Muslimun, for those who are Mustati, they say there's no need for it. Not, as we discussed this last uh, week, not practicing is not kufr, it's fisk, all right? But not accepting is kufr. That the Prophet said this, but I don't accept it. That's kufr as well. So kufr has different meanings and different degrees. <laughs> Not only, no. Yes, yeah. uh, yes, Especially in this verse, Salam just in this verse, because it says, Anfiqu mimma and it is rejection of infaq, which says, Wal kafirunahumudhalun, isn't it? It's not rejection of things above this, yes. Thank you for your time. 
Uh, can you clarify, the, uh, in, um, in Ayat al-Kursi it says, Al-Hayyu al-Qayyum, and in Surah Kulhu Allahu Ahad, it says, Allahu Samad. Are they the same? Does it mean the same? The English translation seems to, you know, come up with the same words, eternal. Samad self-sustaining, they say, isn't it? Yeah, or yeah, eternal as eternal well, they say. I don't think eternal, eternal is, a, is a good translation for Samad. Samad is self-sustaining and uh, sustaining others as well. So Samad is uh, a word which includes Hay and Qayyum, both of them. If we take it as someone who does not need to be sustained and sustains everything else. As we have in a narration from Imam Zainul Abidin salam, when he was describing Samad, he said, As Sayyidul Masmoodu Ilayh. The master, who is in no need, but everyone looks to him for needs, for their needs. For Samad, maybe, therefore, Samad may be a more comprehensive term of description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which includes Al Hayyul Qayyum. Al Hayyul Qayyum is actually when we open and elaborate on Samad. <coughs> Shaykh, sometimes in Islam we have very broad and sweeping statements like if you go to Hajj, all your sins are forgiven. And today you made one statement that if you recite Ayatul Kursi after every Wajib Namaz, your Jannah is guaranteed. Um, but it's not so simple, is it? I mean, there's always a qualification. Um, so, I mean, what I'm saying is, why do we have this? First of all, why do we have this when there's always a qualification which no one can meet, except Imam Ali? Why do we have it? And secondly, what is this qualification? Well, let's think that it happens this way. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Let's think that if we recite Ayatul Kursi after every Salat. But the Imam said, people would not succeed doing it, except Saddiqun al all right? So, it may be not possible for everyone to do it, uh, because either they feel not necessary, lazy, things like that. So for someone to stick to it, it means that they have some qualities before that, they, that they stick to this. And uh, I mean, sometimes Allah has given us concessions and things. We better take them, <laughs> inshallah. Is it, is it just recitation or is it um, agreeing with each and every word? No, of course. Agreeing, of course. However, we agree and we understand based on our capacity. I mean, we decide this verse, we understand something which is very, very limited. Then, for example, someone like Imam Ali recites this verse, loud. someone like Obay ibn Ka'ab recites this verse that the Prophet said, what is the greatest ayah in the Quran, which one? And he said, this Prophet was amazed of his knowledge, deep knowledge of the Quran that he recognized it. Rasyan. You know, in the Quran, in so many places, it says that if you obey the Prophet, you're obeying Allah. If you give allegiance to the Prophet, you're giving allegiance to Allah. So, the, Allah has put uh, the Prophet in such a high position because it, after his name, he's put, he's said the Prophet. So, the Prophet, in, I always have this view that he is what he is so high that. Um, and the Quran has put his status so high that I'm not, I'm saying that uh, when a prophet does such that to Allah, it's not that it, he is, he, Allah has created everybody, but Allah has put him in a very high position. So when you go to visit the prophet, you can ask the prophet to intercede for you, or even from far away, you can ask the prophet to intercede for you. I don't, I, I don't feel that I can only ask Allah. You know, when you ask the prophet, yeah. In a sense, you are confessing his position. You are confessing that he is related to God. I mean, these things are very inter intertwined and linked to each other. I'm going to have love for the Prophet. It means what? It means that I have such a faith in Allah that this love is created for him in my heart. Let me tell you one story. This uh, story, I heard it from... Uh, Ayatollah uh, Karati, Sheikh Karati, he said that once I was in Hajj and uh, someone told me that this uh, Sheikh, a very, of course, uh, he said, I do not want to name him because everyone knows him. 
this sheikh has a very interesting story to tell you. Go and ask him. And I went to his, we were in Mena, I went to his, uh, his khayma and I told him, give me your story. And he gave me this story. And I thought, he was talking on TV and crying. And he said, I cannot ever forget the way he was explaining this and describing this. He said that uh, about 45 minutes, he talked and cried, this very prominent person that he didn't want to name. He said that I, I had a dream that I died. And uh, then the angels came to ask me, what have you done? I said, I have written such and such books. They said, not accepted. Next, <laughs> what have you done? I prayed all my life, not accepted. It was mixed with other things. I have given such charities, not accepted, because it was mixed with insincerity. Everything I remember I said, I was crying and saying, why don't you accept all this? They said, because it's mixed with this, it's mixed with that. And they said, nothing is accepted from you. You go to hell. <laughs> and at the end, I cried. I said, do you believe that I even did not love Ali ibn Abi Talib? And then they said, yes, that's true. You love Ali ibn Abi Talib. You are saved. You go. I mean, this is a story mentioned by uh, Sheikh Karati. Now, I mean, this love is an action itself, isn't it? The love for awliya Allah, uh, afdal al-a'mal, al-hubbu fillah, wal bughdu fillah. You love someone because of Allah, or you hate someone because of Allah. These are the actions, afdal al-a'mal. So, as I said, these things are very much intermingled with each other. That uh, at the end of the day, everything goes back to love of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything goes back to that action. To ask forgiveness for you, not to forgive you. No, to, ask to ask, yes, forgiveness. of course, so yes. Of course, yeah, certainly. Bismillah yeah. ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Sheikh, um, the ayah direct to the al-mu'mineen, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu infaqu man ma razaqnaakum. What about the rest of the people? That's question number one. Question number two, um, where it says, infaqu, doesn't mean just money, wealth, good deed, everything else, because it does go on to say, there will be no time for you if you are in debt. You need to pay your debt before you die. You need to do a good deed before you pass away, and so on. So if you can clarify that, I'd be great. Thank well, you. the Quran cannot talk to disbelievers, isn't it? It's... It can talk to disbelievers in very general terms. For example, Ya ayu al insan, ma gharraka bi rabbik al karim. O human being, why are you deceived away from your Lord? Okay? In this sense, yes, Quran can talk generally. All right? Ya ayu al nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakaran wa unsa. But when it comes to injunctions, only the believers would follow. Those who do not believe in the Quran, they would not follow, certainly. So the injunctions of the Quran is only addressed to the believers. Non-believers will say, we do not believe in you in the first place. Why are you commanding or instructing us to do this thing? About the second issue, yes, anfiru mimma razaqnaakum, whatever we have given you. It may be wealth, it may be some, for example, skill, as for example, especially in these battles that the Prophet, some people may have some skills that they could uh, offer. It may be knowledge, anything that Allah has given us. Now, actions are our earnings. But there are certain things that Allah has given us, we have to do and far from them. Okay. Um. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for your lecture. Um, am I right in saying that there are more ayat in the Quran where Allah says that ask me direct and for the Shafa there's only five ayats. So how would you... Uh, uh, I, can't, I mean, why can't we? I mean, for the shop, I mean, if you have that connection with Allah, do you have to? I mean, I don't know. I mean, just asking this question. As I explained, you know, 
whether we ask Allah or the Prophet, we are all asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when we ask the Prophet or Imam, it's because we think that Allah has given them some power to do it. Say, for example, people who went to Jesus for Shafa, lepers, paralyzed people, they went to, to Jesus to give them Shafa, okay? Now, they believe that God has given him that power. They didn't say, Ya Isa, ask God to give us Shafa. They say, Isa, give us Shafa, isn't it? And he did, because Allah had empowered him to do that. So, even when we ask such people, it's because we believe Allah has empowered them. Eventually, everything is to go to it. If we believe that they have a power independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's shirk, certainly. It's shirk. Now, saying going directly to Allah, this is what we are always instructed. Even when we go for ziyara, we ask Allah things. We don't ask the imam. Very rarely you find in any ziyara that we ask the imam or the prophet. Even when we ask the prophet, we recite the verse. We say that the Allah has said in the Quran, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ وَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولُ if they have wronged themselves and they come to you, they ask forgiveness from Allah, and you ask forgiveness for them, Allah will be forgiving. And then we say, Ya Rasulullah, we have come for this demand that you do istighfar for us. So it all goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of shafa, as I said, you know, it's like in this world, we are all guided by Allah, but through the prophets, isn't it? The same thing in the next world. We are all forgiven by Allah, but through that shafa'ah which comes in human world through the prophets. Okay, we'll take the last question. <coughs> Sorry, Sheikh. Uh, my reference is very um, relevant to the Ayatul Kursi because, as you said, it's the heart of the Quran and we have other surahs. Um, when we first came over to this country, of course, we are indoctrinated with. Um, with the physical um, in madrasas, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. So the Muslim God is, is just by perception, one that sets down rules. And then you come to this country and you see big signs, posters everywhere, Jesus loves you, come to church. That word love, to be associated <laughs> with the supreme power, it was not very palatable at the time. But now, when you think about it, for a community that has almost everything, how do you draw people towards their God, to believe in their God? Unless the God is merciful, but the words merciful might, it's probably the best, best description of God. But there isn't that word love. God loves the people. God loves you to come to him. So I find there is a little disparity here. I'm sure there must be ayahs in the Quran that says that God loves you if you do the right things. But you see, the conditions pre-attached. So is there a concept in Islam of God loves you regardless? Because then, theoretically, that goes against the tenets. Because you've got to do what he wants you to do, which is adal justice, mercy, like he is. So is there a concept of God loves you regardless? Or is that a misnomer? Well, this idea that God loves you regardless is a deceptive idea, you know. That's why we don't have it. I mean, no matter what you do, God loves you. Of course, God loves a human being that he creates. But if that human being does very evil things, God doesn't love it anymore and love him anymore or her anymore because of those evil actions. And I... I think Christians themselves know this from their books, that this is not a correct or accurate thing to say that God loves you regardless of whatever you do. It means you are free to do whatever you like, and God loves you. That's not true. And we have many verses in the Quran that say, Allah is angry with them. So how is it possible that Allah loves someone is angry with them? Or Allah cursed them. I mean, this idea is something which appeals to a community which wants to do whatever they want 
and want to worship God as well, isn't it? <laughs> to be connected to God as well. But we have to, of course, be realistic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sheikh. I think Thank we'll you. end there. Salwat.